Hello, everyone. Um, thank you all for joining us today um, for the highest inaugural symposium. My name is Daphne Manusaki, and together with Ephemios Kaxiras, we will be the moderators for the Science and Engineering Symposium. So at this point, I would like, sh shall I invite the panelists Please. now? So I would like to invite the panelists uh, to come and uh, have a seat at the table. So, um, um, Dean Yortsos, please. Uh, Professor Mitkas, Apostolis Dimitropoulos, Margarita Hli, and uh, uh, Fotis Sotiropoulos. Uh, um, I was thinking. All four sessions today will follow the same format. A keynote lecture will be followed by short presentations by the panelists. After the panel presentations, there will be an open discussion between the keynote speaker and the panelists and the audience, that is all of you, and after which the panelists will make their closing remarks. So um, let's start this morning's science and engineering education session. We are delighted to have Dean Yortsos as our keynote speaker. Um, Yanis Yortsos uh, is the Dean of the USC Viterbi School of Engineering and the holder of the Caprillian Dean's Chair and the Dolly Professorship in Chemical Engineering. He is a graduate of the Metsovian Polytechnio in Athens and holds a Master's and a PhD degrees from the um, California Institute of Technology, all in Chemical Engineering. He has held appointments as Chair of Chemical Engineering and Associate Dean of Engineering prior to assuming in 2005 the duties of Dean of Engineering. Yanis was inducted uh, in the U.S. National Academy of Engineering in 2008. He is an Associate Member of the Athens Academy since 2013 and received the Ellis Island Medal of Honor also in 2013. Since 2017, he serves on the Council of the National Academy of Engineering. Along with two colleagues at Olin College and Duke University, he co-founded in 2009 the Grand Challenges Scholars Program, which received the 2022 Gordon Prize of the National Academy of Engineering. In 2015, he spearheaded a US-wide initiative uh, to enhance the diversity of engineering schools uh, sorry, I should have taken my mask off. <laughs> An effort uh, that culminated in the creation of the American Association of Engineering Education of a diversity recognition process now adopted by more than 200 engineering schools in the U.S. For this initiative, he received the 2017 um, uh, American Science and Engineering Education President's Award. Since 2022, he is the PI of the NSF iCourse Hub. West Region, one of the five such innovation hubs in the U.S. Uh, to promote technology innovation in the Western United States. He's an advocate of Engineering Plus, a vision for engineering as the enabling discipline of our times. Dean Yorchos, thank you very much. It's an honor. Ευχαριστώ πολύ, Δάφνη. Ευχαριστώ πολύ όλους που είσαστε εδώ πέρα. Θα ήθελα να ευχαριστήσω ειδικά τον Πέτρο και τον Ανδρέα Μπουντουβί, ο οποίος ήταν εδώ σε μια φαντάζομαι επιστρέφη, για την τιμή που μου κάνατε να έρθω εδώ και να μιλήσω για το Science and Engineering Education. It's a great pleasure. Uh, as the ambassador mentioned, uh, being in Mykonos, actually I am from Rhodos, so we beat Mykonos every day. Uh, every time of the day, in terms of beaches and things like that. Just, 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 just letting you know. <laughs> Actually, the next event maybe should happen in Rodas, Pedros. I, I will provide uh, <laughs> recommendations for places there. Um, my, uh, I have decided to talk a little bit about uh, science and engineering education in general, with some emphasis on what we should be doing here in Greece. I think we can be pioneers in this in some way, as you will see in a moment. I wanted to mention that uh, this is the inaugural symposium. I see, I suppose I have to push a button for down. Uh, 
goes from here. Ευχαριστώ. Α, συγγνώμη. Έχουμε και αυτό. Οκ. Κάρι. As I was looking at the, at the uh, program, I realized that there was a big word missing from the bridges. It was bridges in education, science, and innovation. So I added in blue engineering as well. I'm an engineer by training. I think engineering and science are converging. And so it's important to also call out engineering as well, though, because engineering somehow happens to be um, sort of a, ignored a little bit. We talk about science. I think it's important to recognize that engineering and technology are essentially driving our world today together with science. But I think we should be calling out the world engineering as well. So that's my little contribution to this uh, thing there. Um, back in 2004, the National Academy of Engineering and the uh, National Research Council published a, a report called the engineer of 2020. Many of us in higher education and engineering read this report very carefully because it shaped the evolution of engineering education in recent years, since 2004. Became a dean in 2005, and I remember how important it was for me to articulate a vision for engineering in the United States, in, in the United States, in my own institution. That was preceded actually by another report called in, uh, in the uh, innovation um, that happened in the United States in the 20th, 20th century, and that's actually relevant to the engineer of 2020. The interesting thing is, though, the engineer of 2020 graduated two years ago. And so the question is, what is the engineer of the future? What is the future engineer of 2020? This is a question that's up for grabs right now. I, I know that the National Academy of Engineering in the United States is trying to perhaps create a new report or a new effort in this area. But what about if we actually use this as an opportunity to create the new engineer of 2020 for Greece? What about if we put together a group here and try to understand what should be the attributes and the education necessary for the engineer of 2020, the Greek engineer of 2020? That's actually a, pr a proposal that I'm making here as part of my contribution. I will make one more proposal in a moment. <laughs> and I will discuss possible bu building blocks for this. And many of them will involve grand challenges. The word grand challenge came out as part of the conversation that we had earlier on here. I think grand challenges will become important because purpose is something that's becoming more and more important on what we do in our life. Choosing goals is an ethical decision. And when the, whatever goals we choose reflects what is our ethics and what's our determination. And therefore, the next question will be, what are the grand challenges for engineering in Greece? This has essentially created a roadmap, and this roadmap will also be able to allow us to think about the connections and the bridges that we can have between the US or the world and Greece itself. I think these are two issues. When I was elected into the uh, uh, Academy of Athens as the Pistelon Melon, I actually posed the same question then. What are the grand challenges for engineering in Greece? I did not get an answer for the last nine years. Hopefully we'll be able to come up with something that says, these are the big grand challenges. Without setting these big grand challenges and goals, I think we will miss a lot of opportunities to develop systematic things to move ahead. And I know that these are not easy things to do because there are politics, there are policy issues associated with that. But I think it's a very important opportunity for us to pursue. Um, because I may run out of time, I just give you the summary of my presentation here. Some of the key considerations. I define technology and engineering in a very simple way, leveraging phenomena and creating knowledge. This is actually what we do as engineers. We not only, and scientists, we create knowledge, but also we leverage phenomena for useful purposes. And there is a convergence associated with that because a single discipline does not alone, is not able alone to create these phenomena and create synergies. The second is what I call the four buckets. And this is sort of a Maslow's hierarchy for the planet. 
There's a Maslow's hierarchy for individuals, which is, you know, how individuals progress from being safe, secure, healthy to uh, enjoying life. And I think the same thing applies to what we do in a field like engineering and a discipline like engineering and sciences as well. A third very important question, and I think this is clearly clear to everybody, is that the world is moving exponentially fast. Now, uh, in the absence of uh, geopolitical uh, disturbances, wars, and so on and so forth, if we let innovation pre proceed, it will not only go exponentially fast, it will go even faster than that. And I have a theory for this, which I will show you in a moment. This requires purpose, this, uh, and because of this technology, which is exponentially fast, you can be, therefore, solve big problems. And that's actually the opportunity ahead of us. How do we use this tremendous power that we have in order to solve problems? And that means purpose, agility, and I use the word innovativeness. But technology, as we have seen very clearly, contains also the seeds of unintended consequences. And unintended consequences can be equally powerful. And this is where trustworthiness and uh, human centricity come into play. We cannot pretend that as engineers or as scientists are decoupled from society and that what we do is for the sake of advancing technology itself without considering the ethical considerations that come along. Social media is a classical example of this and I will say a few words about that. Finally, in a world which is exponentially fast, skills and knowledge change all the time. Therefore, what's important is not necessarily skills and knowledge themselves, but is mindsets. What do we think about this as well as the creation of ecosystems as well? And finally, uh, um, I will say a few words about our Grand Challenge Scholars Program was mentioned as part of the, of the, um, of the uh, uh, Gordon Prize. I don't know if I will have time to show you a little commercial that I have at the end. Maybe I do, maybe I don't. But anyway, I can, I can tell you that this is something that uh, finds a lot of resonance in many universities in, in the United States. And essentially says that outstanding technical competence it combined with outstanding character will lead to uh, trustworthiness. And that's actually where Greek values can offer tremendous possibilities in addition because of the fact that we have a, a history of, of thought, a history of, uh, of uh, ethical and moral um, uh, tenets that actually can be used in how we shape a, a world where technology and humanity are intertwined in a closer and closer way closer than ever before. And I think that will be the challenge of the future. How do we make sure that technology and humanity actually get in sync and be able to accomplish uh, many of the positive things that we can do so that we can have a better life overall? And I will also say a few words about some of the bridges that we can create and so on and so forth. So here's my definition of technology and engineering. I know that this is a bit, uh, you say, well, you know, that's too simplistic, but actually I believe in it and whenever I use it, to tell people, particularly people who are not in engineering and technology, they sort of say, oh, that's kind of an interesting idea. That it's leveraging phenomena for useful purposes. So this is the way I define the, the world that we're living in. It's paraphrased from a book by Brian Arthur in 2008, The Nature of Technology, which is actually a very interesting book to read. In the past, we have been dealing with things like phenomena that are physical or chemical or geological, uh, we're talking about, let's say, people that deal with the subsurface, or uh, climate, or biological. And that is an increase, I have an arrow there of increasing complexity uh, uh, in this direction. Now, I know physicists will say everything is physics, so no offense here. I uh, just want to make sure that for the rest of us, <laughs> you go from physics to chemistry to biology uh, in terms of complexity. Um, and the most complex of all, is social and behavioral. And I think social and behavioral becoming part in many different ways of what we do as engineers, particularly computer scientists. The use of data science, the use of AI is getting closer and closer to understand social and behavioral phenomena and, to, and also be able to leverage this for useful purposes. So it's important to notice that useful purposes is not an objective world, is a, is a subjective world because it means usefulness and what is use, useful to someone is not useful to another. And this is where the ethical part comes in when we talk about technology because whatever we do has a purpose in mind and that purpose can be useful to some but not necessarily useful to another. And I think that's something we have to keep in mind as we move on. By the way, phenomena uh, means also systems and devices and tools and combinations. And by 
Purposes, I, I, and also, uh, purposes are also include the discovery of new phenomena, which we do at the interface between science and engineering. So for me, this is sort of a, a, a simple way to encapsulate what we do in the, in the STEM disciplines. And I, 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 I use this often as an example for, for, for describing this. Now, the National Academy uh, published last year, uh, I'm sorry, last, uh, the, uh, in 2002, I believe, a, cent a, a, a compilation of a century of innovation, things that happen in, in the world in terms of innovation. Most of those at that time were, let's say, electrification, automobile. In the, 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 century of the 20th century has been phenomenal in terms of uh, advances in technology. Many of these things that you see here did not, in, were not in place before that, right? So one question that comes in then is, what will be the innovation story of this century? You know, and actually this question has been uh, written or has been asked before. Are we going to be able to create innovation that will be as transformative for the 21st century as it was, as the innovation was in the 20th century? And that's a question that has been asked by economists, by others as well. Is it possible that solving big grand challenges will be the big innovation of, of the century? Is it, uh, dealing with th things like climate change or uh, 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 the end of illness, as some people talk about, uh, in, in the case of, for example, medicine. Are these the, the things that we have to start focusing on in some different way as well? Let me talk to you a little bit about what I call the four buckets. energy, water, uh, air, increasingly food. We had a, 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 a meeting in, in London 2019 pre-COVID uh, of the National Academies and the, and, the, and, the, and the theme of the meeting was how to feed 10 billion people, which is the expected you know, number of people in, in, in the planet. That is not a, a, something to, to, to scoff of, given the war that's going on right now, we understand also how important food becomes. Second bucket is security. By security, I also include here national security to some extent, because part of the security is also infrastructure, cyber security, protection of privacy, for instance, at the same time also uh, 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 protecting from nuclear terror, which is a, a possibility in not too long into the, into the future, perhaps. Health and enriching life. And by enriching life, I sometimes also uh, so I try to um, connect all this to a Maslow hierarchy. Maslow hierarchy, as you know, is a psychologi psychological term. I don't know much about it, but I learn about it. And it has things like, uh, uh, as you go from the bottom of the sort of the triangle to the top, you go from fundamentals of, 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 of need, let's say, to be sustainable, healthy, and secure, and then uh, how to, to get into, into situation it includes uh, emotions, love, um, I, the top there is uh, um, uh, enriching your life to some extent as well. And behavioral and societal aspects actually are part of enriching life. What we do a lot with, let's say, new computing technologies, essentially it enriches life because it allows you to do so wonderful things, uh, connect with the internet, uh, connect with other people. They are all things that relate to, to, to the connection that we do uh, in life. In the 2008, uh, the National Academy had articulated specific grand challenges in these buckets. A read for sustainability, make solar energy economical, provide energy from fusion. Providing energy from fusion will solve all our energy problems. Of course, it's a, much, it's a very tough problem to solve. Uh, develop carbon sequestration methods. At that time, it was uh, still, you know, fossil fuel was important. Managing the nitrogen cycle. Security, as I mentioned, preventing nuclear terror health, engineer better medicines, uh, reverse engineer the brain. These are all part of the National Academy of Engineering Grand Challenge. There was a committee of people that were put together to sort of say, what are the big issues that we will deal into the future in engineering? And for enriching life uh, includes as well, uh, engineer the tools of scientific discovery, which means essentially how to promote science and discover in science. And so um, these, these grand challenges were followed by other moonshot ideas. For example, from the UN Sustainable Development Goals uh, that were articulated in 2015, if I'm not mistaken, many of them 
have a lot of societal and human-centric aspects. The question is, are we as engineers going to deal with that? My answer is yes, because this interface between technology and humanity is becoming tighter and tighter, and I think sooner or later we have to deal with all these, these important questions as well. Why grand challenges? Because powerful, fast-evolving and convergent technology allows us to set achievable goals for all humanity. What are the grand challenges, as I mentioned, for Greece? Choosing goals, I mentioned, is an ethical question. And I will make here a little bit of a uh, tongue-in-cheek thing. Human nature does not change exponentially fast. Technology does. And so I think that's something that we have to take advantage of in some way. And I'd like to bring up back again the question, what are Greece's grand challenges for engineering? Whatever we do in education, how we train our students here, perhaps needs to be informed by this. Maybe we have an introductory class in uh, the, uh, the mom, in, in, in Polytechnio in, or, or, the, or physics or other departments and say, these are important questions for Greece right now. Let's focus our ideas about how to move ahead and solve them. So here now we'll become a little geeky and I tell you a little bit about my ideas about how innovation works. First of all, uh, I, I make the following point, which is actually not mine, it's somebody else's. I forget wh where I read it. If you take materials, energy, and knowledge, only the latter, knowledge, has the property that the more it is consumed, the more it is produced. Whereas materials and energy, the more you consume, the less you have. In, in, with knowledge, it's exactly the opposite. That's the fundamental basis of innovation. The more knowledge we have, the faster we get. It's an auto-catalytic reaction, Andreas. You will know that <laughs> as a chemical engineer. And so when people talk about Moore's law, I look at it very differently. I look at it as a simple chemical reaction, which is a linear reaction goes from A, gives you A, and it's an auto-catalytic one, and therefore the rate of change is proportional to the kinetics, as you can understand. It's first order kinetics, those of, 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 of those of you who are chemical engineers, gives you an exponential. You say, well, that's trivial. Well, what is actually non-trivial to some extent is that if you put quadratic kinetics, in other words, it takes the collisions of two such innovations to produce something new, the rate of change is actually kinetics goes to the power of two, and that gives you a singularity. Those of you who are familiar with Kurt, Ray Kurzweil, he published a book called uh, The Singularity is Near. He's a chief engineer for Google who says that the world changes not simply exponentially fast, but actually it's approaching a singularity at some point in time. Now, Kurzweil has never told you what that time is going to be. He, at, at the beginning, he said it will be 2000, uh, 2030. Now I think it says 2035. Maybe it's uh, later than that. However, when you look at the tremendous innovation in AI and machine learning and all that, we are not too far from a, a new world where we are actually a lot, going a lot faster than before. You can see how dramatically AI is actually penetrating pretty much everything that we do and how we have to rethink our, the way we think in terms of uh, educate our students by also incorporating this in their conversation. So this is my geeky part. I thought that being in a in a, in a group of, uh, of uh, people like you, I should mention it, and that would be the end of, of the geekiness with respect to that. Now, if you look at an exponential world that changes exponentially fast, and that's the, the technology as a function of time here, and I, I just plotted here a, a curve here. No, the units are arbitrary, so I don't have any, everything is dimensionless, so don't tell me how I made things dimensionless. <laughs> I have a, a, a curve here. What I'm trying to say here is that the world does not change this way. The world changes along the tangent. We are able to extrapolate linearly, but we cannot extrapolate in a way that's exponential. What does this create is it creates a, a deficit of trust because the so society, politics, governments work in this direction, technology moves in this direction, and because we have this gap, there is a trust a deficiency that, that, that needs to be, to be, to be uh, um, uh, bridged. And I think that's another part of trustworthiness that I want to talk about for our students and for us to understand that this is a simple 
uh, explanation for a lot of the things that happen in the world today. The anti-vaxxers, the people that believe in this and that, the, the conspiracy theories and all this, I think is a result of the fact that we are over here as scientists, as engineers, the world is over here. And I think this, being able to capture this gap is very important. In addition, what it says is that we cannot simply rely on knowledge and skills, but we have to start thinking in terms of mindsets and the creation of ecosystems. Why is that? Because let's say AI today is a phenomenal technology and everybody knows about it. How do you know that five years from now, you know, there's going to be no, a new technology that will be even more powerful or more faster than that? We cannot understand that unless we have the, the flexibility and the agility to make that change. So when we talk about synergies, opportunities to connect and everything, I think we should challenge ourselves not to think ourselves as being behind something, but actually to try to create something new, perhaps, that can help us move forward because we are all, in a sense, have the same opportunity to make this change. And I see this, this, this uh, uh, um, uh, organization here today as an opportunity to actually take advantage of that. It's up to us to, to, say, to think this way in a bold way and say we can set the, the trend in this particular way. And so I just wanted to just give you uh, a little bit of that. We talk a lot about innovation. Many of you know how this works. Without innovation, the impact is minimal. And by innovation, we mean that taking the, the idea, taking the, the patent, taking the uh, technology development, the IP, and making it in practice. Um, I, as we, many, many university institutions, and I hope that we can implement something similar to this in our institutions here, is having this um, sequence of, of seed, of, of nurturing, of um, uh, validating, launching, and accelerating, which is sort of the, the, the cycle of innovation that happens and then be able to, to be successful. So, in fact, um, I it was mentioned in my very long introduction out there, <laughs> I'm leading an effort uh, based on the uh, i -Corps model of the National Science Foundation, which is based on Lean Startup methodology, which a methodology was invented at Stanford that allows you to essentially take ideas much faster. This is tr a simple training that can happen to pretty much every student and we do this in our own institution. I think it can happen here in all, all, all universities and it may, it may be happening as well, I'm not sure, to allow us to get our students to understand that under, having the knowledge and the skills is not sufficient if you want to have an impact and be able to see how you create this impact. And as I said, I don't want to uh, uh, pay injustice to things that may already be happening. Um, I will close with a, 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 um, a, um, uh, saying a few things about technology ethics. Whenever we do something, uh, let's say a startup, a new, ent a new entity, we always work at the intersection of smart, legal, and ethical. Clearly, you don't start something which is not smart, then nobody's going to support you. If it's illegal, clearly you're going to have a problem. And for the most time, whatever people start is ethically neutral. You start something and say, if I do this technology, it will be interesting. And may, many people have a idea of that this will change the world. I mean, that actually is part of, of a lot of the things that we do. But, and these are goals driven by values, but we have unintended consequences. And the more, imp the, the more powerful the technology, the more powerful the unintended consequences. So we cannot not, thinking, not think about the fact that there will be unintended consequences. And uh, this, because this will affect policy, legislation, politics, and all that. And I think uh, if, you, if I were to sketch what's going on, let's say, from something that starts at the intersection of smart, ethical, and legal, often bifurcates. Some of it stays in the core, and it's the, the technology that provides all the the, 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 it's very useful for society at large, and then you have these branches out here that branch outside of the ethical part, and I think this is where we have to be, uh, to un not only understand it, but perhaps be able to uh, anticipate it, possibly, I'm not sure. And that actually provides yet another uh, component that our students need to know. Traditional engineering education, when I was at so Polytechnio, I took two non-engineering courses. One was on logic, non-engineering course, and the other was on some economics. Uh, to be honest with you, I don't even remember what it was about. And these were the only two courses we, we took outside of the technical stuff. Now, did this uh, bother me? 
To be honest with you, the high school education we have in Greece does a phenomenal or did a phenomenal job in teaching you ethics, values, and all that. And I don't know what's the situation today with respect to the training of students or training, how our students learn about history and, and values and all that. But I, I want to make sure that this is something that is important. Uh, finally, I believe that society will demand trustworthiness from all our students. Now, what is trust? Trust can be separated in two components, competence and character. You don't want to trust someone who is incompetent, but he has the best character. You have a pilot who doesn't know how to fly the plane, but is a wonderful person. <laughs> you don't trust this person. Conversely, you don't want to trust a, co a, 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 a very competent pilot who is a bad character to some extent. So this is four, four cores of credibility. This is from uh, Steve Covey, the spirit of trust. One is capabilities, talent, attitude, skills, mindsets, results, performance, and so on and so forth. And the other is character, integrity, humility, courage, intent, motive, agenda, behavior. I think these are things that in Greece, we have a tremendous repository to think, to use this as a, a, and be actually a model in how we train our students and how to engineers to be able to create this trustworthiness that is be, becoming increasingly absent from, from the world that we live today. And I think this has to do with the fact that technology is moving so fast, the world does not respond equally fast and you create this gap. So I'm just putting this as an idea. So five ingredients for engineering education, superb te technical skills and knowledge. I call it hug the exponential. So if you Google it, probably it will take you to, 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 to something that I wrote about hugging the exponential, staying with the exponential and also shaping it. Particularly in modern computing technologies, computing technology is becoming the essential part of what engineers, uh, uh, the fundamental skills of engineers today. And this could be AI and machine learning, data science, it's possibly quantum computing. Quantum computing is coming along much faster than we, 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 we think. Uh, could be quantum sensing, com communications, other things. Possibly quantitative and computational biology, which is another important part for medicine and health, right? So I think our students need to have exposure to this. And this must become probably a standard requirement as calculus. We pay a lot of attention to calculus and as, you know, for good reason, these things perhaps need to change. Convergence, which I call engineering plus and interdisciplinarity. Now, many, uh, many universities in the US, obviously, because they have uh, humanities and social sciences and others, the business schools and, and the like, this convergence happened for obvious reasons. In a, in a, in a place like, like the, the, uh, in Greece, let's say, where technical uh, polytechnia are somehow different, separated from, we have to create those bridges. I, I don't see how we can move on without creating those bridges or be able to, to, to do this in an effective way, both within STEM and outside. I mentioned innovation and entrepreneurship, understanding human nature and cultures, that's important as well, because aligning goals when the interface of technology and humanity is increasingly intertwining, intertwining is very important, and obviously societal impact. In the United States, societal impact is becoming even more important because there are so many tensions about uh, issues of diversity, inequities, you know, populations that have been marginalized and the like. Maybe there are here in Greece as well, I'm not sure. I don't, I'm, I'm not current of, of the things that are going on. So I believe that as we think about the engineering education uh, and what are the, the, the components of that, we should keep in mind all these components, which is not simply the fundamental strong technical part, which I think all of us uh, have, been, have benefited in a very significant way, but start thinking also in a bigger way as well. Um, so let's create the engineer of 2035, I said here for Greece, so I, I created it over there, and see how we can do that. Uh, I volunteered to help. <laughs> um, the Grand Challenges Scholars Program, I'm done in one minute, was conceived in 2009, essentially has this uh, aspect. It's a research, creative, multidisciplinarity, entrepreneurial, cultural, and society conscious. So what I just gave you is a bit of my thinking about how engineering education should proceed. By the way, this is not all curricula based. This has a lot of extracurricular activities. That's something that universities have a hard time dealing with because the question is, do they get credit or don't get credit? Do they pay tuition? They don't pay tuition. These things of this type that are all technical, but for our students are remarkable. Our students will get together, 
create startups, do things like this, and they don't care about this is part of the curriculum or not. And I think we have to create these ecosystems and encourage them to be able to be successful. I heard some very, uh, very positive news here from all kinds of different things as well. So this particular program, I uh, received the, the, the Gordon Prize of the National Academy this year. Uh, I had a video, but my time is, uh, is, is, is over, so I will just stop here. And I just wanted to uh, uh, thank you for, for your attention. I have a very quick uh, Creating Bridges idea. The internet is allowing us to do so many different things, plus the COVID demolished and shuttered ideas about how you, you collaborate. It's so easy nowadays to do joint classes. Actually, we have been at USC, we have, we have a platform, a technology platform we call iPodia, that we partner with 12 universities across the, across the world and we share classes. A class is taught by a professor. It's taken by both students from both sides. Nobody changes money, that it doesn't cross, there's no tuition exchange or anything like this. And students can benefit together. For example, we have a class with a Technion. I'll just give you an example of that. Uh, we have with uh, Tsinghua University, other places. It's actually wonderful to see how students from different places work together. Now, of course, you know, for a, a, a university, public universities in Greece that require the, the, the support of the Ipurion uh, in order to be able to do that, we have to be agile and figure out how to do this. Anyway, um, one final, uh, uh, a few final things. Sharing curricular practice of innovation, I would very much be interested in if we take the i -Corps program of the National Science Foundation and bring it here. And that will require some sort of an agreement between the corresponding entities in the United States and here. The i -Corps program has been very strong, allows you the creation of innovative spirit and innovation, innovation mindset. Uh, sharing human-centric principle values and, and, and technology ethics, that, that's another part because of our tradition and our history that they can actually do in a very significant way. And finally, creating research partnerships between US federal funding agencies and their Greek counterparts. I know there is an effort to perhaps, or, or a call to create a, a, a Greek NSF, if we can do that and then have a strong partnership that way, that would be phenomenal. And I'll stop here, I have abused my time. So thank you for your attention.